with my dog in this apartment. And it was almost like my body just got forced down to the bed. Like I'm starting to feel this panic set in. Like my dog is shaking. And as I close my eyes, I see this spaceship coming for me. And through this shower curtain, I see all these aliens line up around my shower. Hello and welcome back to the Amos Falls podcast where I interview regular people with incredible stories. Today's guest has such a rich testimony that I have to cut about a third of it from this video. If you want to know the full context, I recommend that you go watch the extra footage on Locals. Link is in the description. But in short, she grew up with an abusive and meth-addicted dad to the point that she had to run away from home at a young age. One thing led to another and she eventually became a sex worker. Along with that, she got attracted by the new age and had numerous supernatural encounters, one of which where she was visited by aliens. Her experiences give her great insight into the nature of these beings and why they're here in the first place. She is now the host of the Raised and Redeemed podcast and a woman that I have a lot of respect for. So welcome in our guest and immerse yourself in the life story of Michaela Nikolenko. Yeah, so right around the time that I left for college, uh, my grandparents ended up passing away. Um, my grandpa passed away my senior year, around my senior year of high school. And then my grandma passed away when I was a freshman um, in college. And my dad had just gotten out of prison finally. Like he was in prison from 13 to 18 for me. And so my dad got out of prison. I go away to college. And I think that my grandparents finally just let go. Like I think that they thought, okay, she's going to be okay now. You know, she made it to college. I got a full ride scholarship because I worked so hard in school because I knew that this would be my only way out, um, out of my family situation, out of my town, out of everything. So I got the full ride and like they thought that I was okay, but truth is like I needed them still. Like they were my rock. They were my accountability. They were my safe place, my home, like my only stable family. And so when they passed, this just sent me on a spiral of feeling like I was alone in the world. And the biggest thing that Satan always got me with was this like poverty and scarcity and you're not going to have enough to survive and it's not going to be okay. So I get to college and yes, my, my tuition's covered. My room and board is, is covered. Um, but now I'm comparing myself to all of these like super wealthy girls, like the sorority girls. And I'm feeling so intimidated by this because all I ever wanted was love going back to, the, to filling that love void. And now I'm thinking the thing I have to do to get the kind of love that I want is be a, like a girl like this. I have to have those kind of clothes, have that kind of makeup, drive these kinds of cars. Like this is going to be what gets me the love that I'm, that I think I want at this point. So my next conclusion is the only thing that separates me from them is money. It's just money. So me and my roommate, we were both on the same scholarship program. And this scholarship program was for kids like us who did really well in school, but just didn't stand a chance in the world. You know, first generation minority kind of kids. So her and I ended up talking each other into going to the strip club for the first time. Um, and this was the summer before the official freshman year of college began. Um, but for my scholarship program, I had to be there early. Uh, so I was there that summer. So we started stripping. Um, but then when the semester started, I wanted to like, I just wanted to be a normal college kid. Like I wanted to go to the frat parties. I wanted to go to my classes and all these things. And some things had happened at the strip club, um, as well to where I just, I stopped going, but now I had this taste for money. So this is what led us into seeking out sugar daddies. And we got the app seeking arrangements. And, you know, one of my friends who was a little bit more brave, she was the bold one of us. She was like, yeah, all I had to do was go to Chick-fil-A and he gave me a hundred dollars. And so this started planting the seed that, okay, this is even easier. Like I don't have to like work a whole shift at night. Um, but before I knew it, I was doing just, I was in the most crazy situations doing the craziest things for money as an 18 year old, um, that I never even imagined I'd be doing. Um, so this led to more numbing and coping and I was blackout drunk three to four days or yeah, three to four days out of the whole week. Um, but I still had straight A's. I'd always been a straight A student. So nobody saw that I was hurting or the fact that I was self-destructing at this time. I have a question about the sugar daddies that you were involved with, because this is a consensual thing. You're on the app, you offer your services. Did you understand what you were doing or were you just numb to the point that you thought that this was normal and okay? 
I think I was numb to the point that I thought this was normal and okay. Um, and going back to the fact that I had been giving my body away for free since I was 12 years old. Mm. And so at this point, like my purity, I already felt like was gone. So sex wasn't like, I didn't see it as a sacred thing. I saw it as a tool I could use to get what I needed. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was pretty just numb to what I was doing at that point. Okay. And that lasted for a little bit, but then it stopped. And at some point you went to serve to a church for a community service that you had to do. Um, how did you end up there in the first place? Because th there's a long story about how that happened, but can you give a little bit of context as to how you had to serve time in a church? Yeah, that's a good question. So the Christmas break of my freshman year. So I only lived about one semester and one summer just being super crazy party girl doing any and everything. Um, so that Christmas break, I ended up meeting somebody. Um, and, you know, I really believe like however you like whatever the foundation of a relationship is, uh, shows you what it's rooted in and how it's going to end up. So I started this relationship mm -hmm. with this guy. Um, it was based on sexual immorality and, you know, getting high and stuff like this. But I felt like he was the first guy to ever really care about me. And he was, you know, my age, but he would spoil me. Like he would take me out to eat fancy dinners, would take like, would buy me whatever I wanted. Um, and so for the first time I was like, oh my gosh, like, I think this is what I was looking for. And I wanted to be better for him. So I wanted, you know, at this point, I'm like, I can't keep sleeping with sugar daddies and doing stuff like this. Like I have to give this stuff up. So him and I now are getting into fast life things for money, selling things, stealing things, um, doing all kinds of things for money. Cause now we're a team. It's like Bonnie and Clyde, we're doing this stuff together now. And it was just a summer of chaos, of lying, cheating, fights, being drunk, getting high, stealing, just a crazy summer. And one day I decided to go to the mall. Uh, I'd been shoplifting since I was in middle school and I had never gotten in trouble. Um, but now I'm 18 years old. So I go to the mall and I go to one of our favorite stores uh, that we would shoplift from. And it's so stupid because I stole like like five Vineyard Vines t-shirts um, because this is what it was popular. This is what the frat boys wore, what the sorority girls would wear home of the frat boys. Like this is what, you know, the in crowd had and they were too expensive for me. So I wanted to still have them though. And so I shoved them in my bag and I buy one thing because that's, I thought it looked less suspicious if you buy at least one thing. Um, and as I'm walking out of the store, uh, some guy comes running after me and tells me to stop. And I think he was like loss prevention or something. So next thing I know, I'm in the office at the back of Von Mar, um, at this mall in Indiana. And this guy is telling me that they've been building a case on me and my boyfriend. And he's like, if you would tell me his name and admit to the other things that you've taken with him, uh, it won't be so bad for you. You'll get less time and like less of a punishment. And at this point, I'm like ride or die. I'm like, I'm not telling them nothing. So I end up leaving them all this day in handcuffs. And at this point, like this was like a beyond scared straight moment for me where the only thing I ever had going for me in life was this scholarship program. So I'm panicking that like I'm going to lose everything. So I'm staying with my aunt for a couple of weeks um, back in Indiana, my hometown where I graduated high school. And I remember laying in the pool this day and I had just found out that he was cheating on me again. Like I just took charges. Like I didn't rat him out to the cops. I find out he's cheating on me again. None of my friends had made any effort to visit me all summer. I realized all I had was like these party girlfriends. I hated what I was studying in school because once again, I was studying just what I thought would make me money, not even what I was happy doing. Um, my family had tried to visit me numerous times at college, but I would get so blackout drunk, I would ruin the visits. So my relationship with my family was bad. I might be losing my scholarship. Basically, like I was just feeling the weight of the hole that I had dug for myself and of my life. And so I'm laying in this pool, looking up at the sky. And this is the first time I felt God talk to me. And all I heard him say was, let me help you. Just let me help you. Mm. 
And I knew it was God speaking this to me because my life was a mess. Like my, everything was chaos. My thoughts were chaos. And just this voice of peace and security and comfort just came into my came into my head basically and was like, let me help you. And I knew it was God. I just knew it was God. So I started watching church online and all these sermons were like exactly what I needed to hear. And so this is where I ended up doing my community service was this church that I had been watching online. Um, and I remember encountering the pastor and like just feeling the Holy Spirit in this man. Like now for the first time I'm encountering Christians who actually do have the fruits of the spirit um, and do have the Holy Spirit. And I was seeing like a taste of God and like feeling that he was good. And this charge got expunged off my record. And this was the start of my faith of knowing that God is with me and he helped me get through this. And I need God and I'm broken and I need healing and I've done terrible things. Um, so this was like one of the first pivotal moments in my life and realizing I needed God, but I just wasn't sure about Jesus at first. So that would lead into the next part of the mess. Right. Because <laughs> you went to church, but you weren't a believer, even though you went to church. And it's kind of at that time that you also started hating Christianity. So it's kind of a weird mix where mm -hmm. you get pulled towards it, but you also get pulled away from it. And I don't know how long it took for that yeah. to happen, but you did start engaging in a lot of new age practices because like you just mentioned, you were looking for healing and you looked for healing in these places. So can you explain how you went to being interested in the church to being completely disgusted by it? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of universities, a lot of public universities are very, um, I'll just say like anti-God and super liberal. And so I went to Indiana University, a Big Ten university, and feminism was really big at this point. Um, so everybody was really radical about this. And uh, I remember I was working as a librarian too, or like a librarian assistant at this point. And I came across this book called Feminist Perspectives on History, Philosophy, Epistemology, Everything. And I was like, oh my gosh, all we've been hearing is the man's perspective on everything. And this led me to rejecting the patriarchy, everything, Western civilization. I just started distrusting everything. And this eventually led to me rejecting the church as well because I was like, this is just an extension of the patriarchy um, and, you know, male dominion. I didn't believe in the Bible. And it's crazy because I had been reading the Bible at that point and like God was starting to speak to me and I even signed up to go on a mission trip. Um, but now I was like, okay, I know God is real, but I, I don't think he's the Christian God. I think this, the whole Christian, you know, ideology is a form of you know masculine dominance and patriarchal suppression um so i started to hate the christian way of pursuing god and so i got more into like hindu ways and this is what led me into yoga and thinking i would heal through yoga and veganism and really like the new age is so similar to hinduism they're really like basically one in the same ideology wise and uh next thing i know i'm getting into the idea of like ancient alien origins and just all these Gnostic beliefs about our creation and our existence and um, thinking now like I'm going to heal myself. And so this is the new age practices just got to be a bigger focal point in my life um, than God even at this point. Here's the interesting part because you heard God's voice and he said, let me help you. And what you did instead is you said, no, I will help myself. And yeah, you got into everything, interested in everything except Christianity. And one of the things that you got yeah. interested in that I think is interesting and doesn't get a lot of attention is sex magic. What is that? And can you explain mm -hmm. the practices that you were doing at this point in your life? Yeah. So it would take a little bit longer for me to get into the depths that were sex magic, but it started, you know, one door opens the next. Um, and so I was now ending my sophomore year of college and believing like, you know, God isn't real, but the universe is real. Like now the universe is my God. Um, so I end up moving to Arizona to be with this boyfriend and this yoga school that I had been looking at online is right down the road from me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, the universe brought me here. Like I meant to go to this school. So it was at this yoga school that tarot cards um, got presented to me 
for the first time now in this new sparkly alluring way and I was like oh yeah that could be a cool way to connect with you know God and your spirit guides and the universe and all these things um, a lot of people in these spaces did um, like the other th- classes at this school were like Reiki, angel healing, shamanism, um, meditation classes. So all these people were kind of dabbling in all these classes. So I'm getting exposed to all these ideas and essentially teachings from fallen angels. And white witchcraft was also a thing. I made a friend here. She was my first friend and she would go to these witchcraft circles and I saw it as a good thing. You know, I saw it as fellow broken people who, you know, were kind of rebels of the system and weren't going to be subservient to the patriarchy, but they too wanted to heal and find freedom and all these things. So it was like we would meet in these witchcraft circles and we would be focused on healing, um, healing ourselves, healing the collective, healing together. So I didn't think any of it was bad. I didn't realize um, that these were teachings from demons or any of these things. At the same time, uh, the main yoga teacher of my program was this super like, uh, how do I, I don't even know how to explain this lady. Like she's like the next level, like the kind of guru that you would see, like get famous and be on big stages for teaching these things and leading empowerment for women and stuff like this. And at this point, I'm just like this broken, acne faced, insecure girl who's trying to find her healing, trying to find her power. And so I look at this lady like, oh my gosh, like I want to be just like her. And her teachings were actually so radical that she got kicked out of being a teacher from the program, um, from the yoga program. But she began her own programs for healing. And I'm not going to say exactly what her business is called, but it it was based on ISTA. And ISTA is a program. I don't know if I'd call it a program, but it stands for International School of Temple Arts. And they go all around the world. They have these conferences in different places. Like I think they've had them in um, like Iceland and they've had them in Phoenix, Arizona. They they have them all over. And it's all these people who come together and basically do sex magic. And you don't call it that though. Like you look at it as an inner healing, inner empowerment, feminine empowerment, learning intimacy, intimacy building, learning to speak your desires, fears, and boundaries. But she began replicating these bigger events into a smaller scale uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. And so I began to be really involved with this, even to the point where I was like a co-facilitator with her. I was on her website and it was all these rituals, like these like death rituals, um, yoni painting, which is like painting your, you know, and printing it on paper. And this is a part of healing your, your feminine and um, soul gazing where you're looking into the eyes of another person to see their soul and to heal yourself. And it was like basically women who are naked all weekend doing these rituals, trying to find healing and not realizing once again that like this is really demons capitalizing on our vulnerabilities and coming in through our traumas and just making things worse. Like we think that these things are going to heal us, but the only solution that you're given is that the next workshop, ayahuasca, some kind of drug, or, you know, this guru or the, you know, the universe, or even worse and more scary is yourself that you yourself are going to heal yourself. And it's just this like this weight that you feel to to evolve and heal. And sex magic is really just a part of that. It's to explain more specifically, like what that is, it's, it, it started with um, these breath works together where we would sit with each other, like kind of in crisscross applesauce, and you would wrap your legs around the other person and you would come heart to heart and you would hug and you would breathe as you're lifting the energy up. And so you're moving your body, lifting up what they would call the kundalini energy, and you're moving it through the chakras. So going back into the Hinduism is you're bringing this energy up from the base chakra all the way out the crown of your head and you're trying to manifest, you're trying to heal, you're trying to open your chakras but then it gets it gets darker from there because it starts with just breath and clothes on or, you know, light clothes. And next thing I know, it's full on what she would call womb healing, where these women are like fingering each other basically and calling it womb healing. Um, 
Yeah. And so just like these darker, crazier things are happening and I'm thinking it's in the name of healing, but deep inside too, my intuition is kind of going off. Like, I don't want, like, I, I was just hoping like, right. I, I'm not the example or to be paired with her to do this sort of thing. Um, somebody else can do that. Like, I don't need womb healing, you know, <laughs> like my red flags are going off. Well, that's what I was going to ask too. Cause anyone with a sane mind looks at this and this, this is totally n crazy nonsense. But you were so, I guess, brainwashed that part yeah. of you thought that this was okay. And I guess your red flags yeah. uh, came up at that point, which I would say is probably a little too late already. But, um, yeah, too late. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm just very confused as to how people can truly think that this is, this is good because this, this is just perversion under the guise of healing. Yeah. But here's the other thing, because yep. since so many people are duped into it, my thought is there must be something happening there. It can't just be like nothing, because if, if nothing happened, nobody would go. So was there something tangible that you experienced there? And how did that start? And how did that transition later? You know, that's a good question. I feel like the main thing that I was experiencing was what I thought was empowerment. Um, I thought, you know, the more empowered I felt, the more I felt like I was healing from these child traumas of being, cause like when I was young, I was very shy, very insecure, very quiet. I had to be intoxicated to talk to boys or people or go in public places like that used to be my crutch. And so the more I found this empowerment inside, I thought that I was healing from my childhood traumas, but really it's like this spiritual pride of Satan um, and of his demons that are coming in and giving you this false sense of self. Um, so that's what I noticed. And the big thing too, is that these practices are what led me into the strip club round two, um, because I thought this is going to be a continuation of my, of my healing and of my empowerment and of the goddess rising inside of me. And um, so all of these practices really desensitized me to sex work and thinking that this was like noble work and sacred prostitution. I was thinking like this was like a sacred thing and, and that you help men heal by breathing with them and being intimate with them and gate like soul gazing with them and teaching them about their astrological charts and their emotions. And, and so now I'm thinking I'm going to go back into the strip club round two this time, A, as a part of continuing to heal myself and empower myself and be as a part of helping heal the collective because these men need this kind of healing too. So I was so brainwashed by the devil um, and I didn't realize I was selling myself. But shortly after I got back into the strip club, I did start numbing and coping with alcohol and hard drugs again. Um, hard drugs as in uh, like cocaine and like hitting the bong, you know, stuff like that. Like I never did meth or, or heroin or anything like this, but it's just crazy how much deception I was in to think like this is what I was really doing. But at the same time, I'm numbing and coping again to just live with myself and the things that I was now doing for money again. Right. So what happened is you went into these healing sessions and that made you feel like being a stripper and essentially selling your body was a noble thing, which anyone th yeah. <laughs> that uh, has a normal brain would understand that it's totally the opposite of that. Um, but also you mentioned that you were into the new age a lot. You experimented with mushrooms uh, before that and after, but something that happened is you would have these experiences while you were on trips and you would see these beings can you explain what mm -hmm. you would see, how it would feel, and essentially what you realized these things were? Yeah. So I'll say too is going back, like you said something that I think was really important that people with a normal brain would realize. I think that's why people with such trauma are such prime candidates for falling into the new age and, and sex work and all these things is because the devil knows he knows what our vulnerabilities are, what our pains are, how to manipulate us. Um, and so, 
yeah, it, it is true that a lot of times it's it's those trauma and things that lead us into those places. And when you are an abuse survivor as well, you're so used to your red flags and your intuition being like you have to numb them to survive in a situation like that. So I had not learned to trust the voice of my intuition or the voice of God. Um, in fact, I thought I was supposed to do the opposite of those things to heal and evolve myself and to go into that discomfort to evolve myself. So yeah, definitely trauma was the root of me thinking any of those things were normal and sacred and holy. Um, but to kind of go into your next question about um, psychedelics and the things I would see is I really, you know, for a big portion of my time doing psychedelics, I I had very beautiful experiences. Um, for the whole start of it, I had very beautiful experiences where I felt like I was connecting with nature and with God and with the universe and with spirits. And, um, and I remember like I could see like the plants breathing. I could telepathically communicate with the animals. I could go deeper with people. And, and this is the, the refute I get a lot of times on my channel is people being like, I don't know how you saw demons on this because all I've had is beautiful experiences. Well, for me, for the first couple years of doing them, I had very beautiful experiences too. The devil comes and masquerades himself as an angel of light. Like he's not going to portray himself as he actually is. So I really think that it was when God started to call me out of this that I began to see the truth of it. And this is when I started seeing darker things is because God was pulling me out of hell and removing the veil so I could see the truth and not just what the devil was masquerading it to be. And next thing I know, I'm seeing my friend manifest this like sea urchin demon. Um, and I guess I've, so I don't just like drop that and move on. <laughs> there was one experience where I'm like, I'm shamaning my friend through psychedelics and we end up at this pond and uh, this guy there, he was kind of an acquaintance. He was in the group and he, and he starts having a panic attack and he's like, Michaela, can you please lead me through some breaths? Like I'm, I'm really not feeling myself right now. And so at this point I'm thinking like, that's my purpose. That's what I'm born to do. Like I got you. So he lays down and I'm leading him through breaths because at this point I'm a private yoga instructor. Like I'm meeting people all the, like, this is what I do now. I make money doing this. So I'm leading him through breaths. And as my eyes are closed, I'm just, I'm seeing in my mind's eye, like the depths of the ocean around him. And I'm seeing dead things, skeletons, like the depths of the ocean. And it was really weird, but I'm just continuing to breathe with him and like guide him through these breaths. And when he comes back up, he's not himself. And now I look back, it's like a sea urchin demon had taken him over. His jaw was chattering, going way like side to side, like way out past how it should be maneuvering. His eyes were super bugged. And even my friend who was with me, She's not a believer. She'd never seen anything spiritual like this before. She saw the same thing that I was seeing. She saw this demonic spirit manifesting in him. So this was one of the first things I'd seen um, as God beginning to remove the veil of the truth of what I was doing and of the portals that get opened with psychedelics and um, these new age yogic meditation practices. Um, and it continued on like that. There was another experience that you asked me about. Um, where I was, I'd left this fiance, the guy that I was with through college, and I moved out into my own apartment. And I'm kind of having this life crisis because I'm trying to figure out what am I supposed to do with my life? Like, what is my purpose? And so, my God at this point was tarot cards and psychedelics. Like, anytime I had a question, I would resort to them. And so, I asked this question. This was my intention. And I ate the psychedelics, the, the mushrooms, and I ended up having just another trip from hell where. Like I thought I was going to get, you know, clarity on my purpose and it ended up being like a full blown alien encounter. So I don't know if you want me to tell that story as well. About okay. Before we get into that, I had a question about the previous story because I want to ask about the alien encounter for sure. Um, but the other story where you saw the sea orchard, I don't really, really know what that is, but, uh, the question I have is, were you, all on drugs at that time 
Um, and the other question also, well, it's not necessarily a question, but what I find interesting is a lot of people would say when you're on psychedelics, it's a reflection of your subconscious, but that is, uh, mm. doesn't make any sense in this context because you were two different individuals witnessing the exact same thing, but you were under the influence yeah. of something at that time. Yeah, I was on mushrooms on that day. He was on ketamine. My community started getting into the rave scene. And as they started getting into the rave scene, they started doing harder things like ketamine, things I wouldn't even do. But at the, at that point, I was cool with mushrooms. So yeah, I was on mushrooms when I, when I saw this one. And my friend who also saw the same thing was on mushrooms. But you brought up a great point is like, this was not a reflection of me and my subconscious because she saw the same thing in him that, that mm -hmm. I saw. Right. Okay. So now that that's cleared out the way. Let's talk about the aliens. Because there's a lot of talk about aliens. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I know what they are. But you had an experience <laughs> with beings that were at least looked like aliens. So can you explain yeah. what you saw in detail? Hey, I'm interrupting to tell you that we have a brand new merch line that just dropped. Four new designs are available. Go check them out. They're awesome and they allow you to plant seeds without preaching. Every purchase also helps to support the channel. So if you like what I do here, consider checking them out on unashamed.ca. The link is also in the description. Thank you. I love you. Now let's get back to the interview. Yeah, at that point in my life, I was very intrigued by the aliens. And like I mentioned, when I first got into the new age, I had sort of believed in like these ancient alien origins. And this goes back to like the ancient Sumerian belief of the Anunnaki mm -hmm. um, and that we descended from these these aliens. And I'm just going to say, because people say too, it's like, oh, it's it's your subconscious. No, I thought aliens were these good five dimensional beings and that they were so enlightened and involved or and evolved that we couldn't connect with them as humans because we were like at this barbaric 3D consciousness level and like the humans were really the problem, but the aliens were good. Um, and I thought they were like these benevolent, like almost like spirit guide beings. Um, like I thought very highly of the aliens and I was always researching them. So anyways, I'll go back to, you know, I'm at this apartment and I eat these mushrooms and I'm with my dog in this apartment. And um, I just started experiencing like, it was almost like my body just got forced down to the bed. Like I just like I'm face planted on my bed and I'm looking at my dresser. And I just feel so heavy, like I'm starting to feel this panic set in. And I always say demons come with this spirit of fear. Going back to, you know, God comes with peace. Um, his presence is peace. Demons come with the spirit of fear. But I, I didn't think, you know, I didn't think that. And so I'm laying on the bed and I'm just trying to like calm myself. And I'm looking at my dresser and I close my eyes. And as I close my eyes, I see this spaceship coming for me. And it's kind of like, like this is weird to do, but it looks like this, like something like this, like these tentacles coming out, coming towards me. And as it's coming towards me, I feel this like tremendous fear. And so I open my eyes and I don't see anything, but I know it's still coming. Like I know it's still coming in the spirit realm. I close my eyes. It's closer. I open my eyes. I don't see it, but I know it's still coming. And so just then my room transforms into like this all white lab. And I'm in this lab and there's like this translucent layer all around me. And in this moment, like God, the father, how you would imagine him appears behind me. And once again, I saw this like in my mind's eye because I'm face planted on my bed at this point, but I'm seeing this like not with my physical eyes. Okay. And so I'm seeing him behind me and he's like basically telling me I can stop this right now if you choose me. Like, I can stop this. You don't have to go in there. And I remember telling him, no, I need to know if there's a great mother. I need to know about the aliens. And I didn't see him as God. Like, I just saw like, oh, it's like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like, I, the Christian God, like, I didn't see him as the God, like the God in my presence telling me, like, I can save you from this. So I reject God. And before I know it, I'm in a full-blown panic attack, like bugging out like crazy, crazy lady in my silk peacock robe. My eyes are crazy. My hair is crazy. I'm just hoping nobody comes to my door. I had these neighbor girls who always would knock on my door and want to play. And I'm like, I just, please, you know. And so I crawl over to my dog at this point because I'm like full-blown in panic mode. And I'm thinking... You know, my dog and I are like best friends. Like he's going to make me feel better. I'm going to check on him, see how he's doing. Because my whole point 
of doing shrooms this day was to figure out how to be happy in this apartment. Like, how can I be happy? How can my dog be happy? I was like obsessing over that because we moved out of a nice house into this little ghetto apartment because it's all I could afford. And so I was stressed about my dog. And so I come over to my dog and I'm looking at him and he looks at me and he's literally trembling. Like my dog is shaking looking at me because he did not see his mom looking back at him. He saw what was really existing now within me. Like these alien demons had full blown come within me and I must have been manifesting this and my dog saw this. Um, So my baby, my little puppy boy is like shaking looking at me. And so I'm like, he's not happy here. That's all I thought is he's not happy here. I didn't think it was me or that I was manifesting demons. So I end up going into the shower now because I had lots of psychedelic ex- experiences, you know, in the water, in the bathtub, in the creeks of Sedona. I'm like, okay, the water is going to make me feel better. So I get in the shower and as I'm standing there, it's crazy. I had this marble shower curtain. It was like this white marble and gold shower curtain. And through this shower curtain in this translucent layer of this of the spirit that I've talked about a couple of times, I see all these aliens line up around my shower and they're super tall. And it's, it's once again, it's not like I could reach out and physically like touch them, but it was this translucent layer of the spirit where they're all around me and they're telepathically communicating with me. And so I'm telepathically communicating back and I'm like, listen, this is really scary for me right now. If you guys want to talk to me, You have to present yourself in a way that's not so scary for me. And so before I knew it, I'm seeing this cat-like woman, the silhouette of this cat-like woman. She had these ears and this tail and she was wearing these boots and she's doing all these sexy things and they're telling me that's you. And so now I'm getting visions of this luxury life, this luxury apartment. Um, I'm feeling like I'm being camcorded in this vision and I'm like, they're telling me that I'm going to be paid to just exist um, and that this is going to be my luxury life and I'm meant to be sexy and a sex worker and this is my purpose. So I went into this trip asking, what is my purpose? Asking the demons, what is my purpose? And they came to tell me sex work is your purpose. That's uh, quite a story. Okay. So lots of things happened here. First thing is it's the second time that one of your dogs sees something that you also see. And I'm sure that there's some people at home that will kind of have an idea. Oh, my dog was acting weird this one day and I never saw anything. It seems like animals can see the spirit world much more than we can. So that's very, very interesting. The other part that I took away was that it's not your subconscious because you thought that uh, aliens were really good beings and they were there to help you exactly and they came and you realized that something was very wrong first of all the first feeling of fear yeah. but then you were really scared so you had to ask them to present us something else and then they shape-shifted into something different or something else happened shape-shifted right yeah so their parents changed and okay so a lot of people would say you're on drugs uh this is not real okay <laughs> if you believe that, that's fine. There's a lot of people that yeah. believe that. If you believe, believe that, here's the telltale sign that this was actually demonic and not subconscious. Because while you're having all these things happen to you, you get panic attacks when people mention the name of Jesus. And that's not something yeah. you're researching. You're researching these, like, yeah. these aliens, these psychedelic trips, the new age. And every time someone mentions the name of Jesus, you used to have panic attacks. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. There was one Christian in my whole yoga teacher training, and we had to present on the different forms of yoga. And so she presented on Yahweh yoga. And I, this is when I first bonded with that big guru lady is because I had a full panic attack after that class. And I couldn't understand why. And I thought it was just because of like church trauma and the church was so bad and Jesus was so bad. And, and this guru lady was like, you are wiser than I, than I even knew. Like, you know, like the demons in her were like, oh yeah, this is our girl. And so, yeah, anytime someone would say the name of Jesus, it would be full blown panic attack mode for me. So that's what kind of proves that what you were seeing were not uh, just figments of your own imagination or were not benevolent beings. 
they were opposite yeah. to Jesus. So that means yep. demons. Um, okay, let's move on to a different part of your life. Because um, I don't know exactly how much time passed, but at some point you were in a relationship with a married man. And that's when yep. you first started becoming curious about Jesus. Who was that man and why were you with him and what happened? Yeah, I met him at the strip club that second time around. And um, this is when I was still living with my fiance. So I had an engagement ring on. He had a wedding ring on. Um, but it was like like this instant attraction. And when I say that, it's because, yeah, I think our demons really were attracted to each other. But at that point, being in the new age and having this new age ideology, I was like, oh, he's my twin flame. Our souls recognize each other like this instant spark. No, it was it was the connection of the demons that we were letting run our lives at that point. But I get involved in this relationship with him. And this guy was 10 years older than me. And so he he didn't party a lot. Like he was married. He had two kids. I would later find out two months into our relationship that his wife was pregnant uh, with another on the way. But in the beginning of our relationship, he made it seem to me that like they were separated, but just staying together because of the kids. Um, and all of these things. And because I had kind of been in a similar place with my fiance at that point, ever since we started living this very pagan, like an open lifestyle, our relationship was crumbling and I was still living with him. So I was like, oh, I get that. Like being together, but kind of being like roommates. I had no Christian compass of truth or understanding of the sacredness of marriage and the covenant made under God. So I was like, yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. And I was just so young and naive. Um, so I get into this relationship with him and he gets a location for his work two hours from where I lived. And so I was like, oh my gosh, it's the universe that the universe wants us to be together. So now he's coming every other weekend to see me and we're doing tarot cards together. And all the tarot cards are telling us like, you're meant to be together. Um, there's going to be an initial pain and destruction, but in the end, you're meant to be together. And this is like a love passion relationship. And really it was like such a deceptive relationship because there was so much pain. Um, and I spent the majority of my life alone. Like he, I would see him every other weekend. He would come get what he wanted and needed and he would go back, but he wasn't bearing the responsibility of me or sacrificing for me or any of the ways that the Bible describes true love to be like the way that Jesus lays his life down for the church and she surrenders and submits unto him. Like this man did not take care of me or protect me or wasn't even there for me in my hard moments. But I was so like, I had so much trauma and such a distorted view on what love was and what I deserved that this wasn't a red flag for me. So I continued on in this fake relationship and you know, there was so much like stress too, as the wife would figure out like what was going on. There was a lot of paranoia, shame, hiding, sneaking, lying. And it was just a very chaotic, painful relationship, like the most chaotic, painful relationship. But when you believe in new age ideology, you think that the pain and the fire are all things that are transforming you towards your highest good. Like it's such a warped way of viewing things. But I thought like, oh, this is just the fire we're meant to go through to get us to where we're supposed to be. So eight months go by in this relationship and we're starting to get more serious and we're looking at houses together. I'm thinking about being like a stepmom, like how that's going to look. Um, and I should go back and say too, that he wore a cross around his neck as well. And so this was a red flag for me in the beginning. I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't be in a relationship with a Christian. Like, how is that going to work? And we would have these religious arguments where he like really did believe in the Bible. He just wasn't obeying it. He wasn't obeying God. He was living in rebellion and he was backslidden and he knew that. And he was facing these consequences. Like he was facing these relational consequences with his kids and at home. He was facing these business consequences. Like he was experiencing the consequences of, of his rebellion, but he couldn't give up his sin in that season of his life. I don't know where he's at now, but. In that season, he was bound to his sin, um, but he was aware of the fact that it's because he wasn't obeying God. Um, but I would argue with him and I was like, no, it's the goddess, like the goddess is the truth. And you just, you like to be a fear monger and like, God's not actually mad at you like you think he is. And like, I don't know, like we would have all these arguments and debates. 
But as I did begin to take our relationship more seriously, as we're getting eight months into this relationship, I did start reading the Bible here and there. I remember he would take phone calls with his kids and he would lock himself in the bathroom and we would stay in these hotels and motels every other weekend. So there would always be a Bible, you know, in the nightstand. And I remember opening this Bible one time and the first thing that God began to speak to me about was sexual immorality. And the second thing was that he was going to be coming back soon. And so even though I didn't believe in the Bible, I didn't believe in Jesus, he began to plant these seeds in my heart that, you know, I was going to be caught with my pants around my ankles. Like, And this was like right. a fear for me. Um, it was like a little seed of, of something. Like I was beginning to believe that this might be true. Okay. So you get in a relationship with this quote unquote Christian guy that's not living out the life at all. You get into sin, but that's also how you were introduced to Jesus through him. And that led to one night where this time there was no drugs involved and you saw something that made you realize that the spiritual yeah. world was real and wasn't like your imagination. It wasn't anything else. It made you realize that it was real. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. Like I, I said, I think God really removed the veil on this night for me to see the truth because he knew we were like, there were children being hurt. Like there's people being hurt. And I really think that God was like, let my people go, you know, like the Egyptian plagues. And so on this night, I'm with this man and like, this was, we were, like I said, taking our relationship really serious. And we had this date and we were talking about our future together and what I was going to do with my life, what he was going to do. And we came back from this date and we're at this hotel room and I just, the spirit of fear entered the room and I was feeling this like anxiety and I couldn't really explain it. Um, and he asked me what was what was going on with me. And I was like, I don't know, maybe I'm just feeling insecure right now. I'm not really sure. And so he dims the lights and brings me over to the bed and he sits me down and he's like telling me I'm beautiful and everything's okay. And I'd also taught him soul gazing. And he knew that this helped me like when I'm feeling anxious to connect in and to like be with me, like be super present with me. So he's soul gazing with me. And as he's looking at me, his face begins to morph. And I wasn't even sure like what I was seeing at first. It's so, it's so bizarre. Like when you're seeing like his eyes are going all the way out to the sides and up and down and his mouth is moving around like everything, like his going back to shape shifting. When you talked about the alien shape shifting into that girl, it's like these demons, they shape shift. And so I'm seeing this shapeshifter like happening in his face, but I couldn't really say anything yet. Like, I don't know. I was just still like watching it and it was all happening so fast. And the next thing I know, his, his face begins to turn into these like animal like features. I'm seeing a gorilla come through his eyes and this pig snout. And he's looking like a full blown beast. Like it's scary at this point. And I'm so petrified. But the only thing I could say is I see a beast in you. And I'm just looking at him and, and he's looking back and he's like, I see the same in you. And I don't know, maybe it was mirroring itself back or maybe it was a defense mechanism. I'm not sure. But we sit down and we're now crisscross applesauce, just like looking at each other on this bed, like wait, like curious, like what is going to happen? And his whole being turns into like this black silhouette. And I'm seeing it like the yogi chakra silhouette, the one that's like, sitting there meditating with all the chakras like that's how it looked and i realized later this was god revealing the demonic roots of that as well but anyways he's this whole black silhouette and i'm i'm like beginning to like lose consciousness as i'm looking into the depth of this blackness and as i'm looking into the depth of this blackness these yellow evil eyes come shooting out at me and they're so scary i literally almost faint and he grabs my shoulders and he tells me he's like this isn't a good spirit and like, yeah, I know yeah, at this point. <laughs> so he gets up on his knees now and he's like trying to fight this battle on his own. So I was, I had a hard time with this after I did become a Christian because I was like, um, why didn't he call in the name of Jesus? Well, he knew that he was living in sin and living in rebellion and he wasn't ready to give those things up. So he's trying to fight this battle on his own. So he gets up on his knees and he's squeezing my hands and his, his eyes are squeezed shut and he's breathing really like hard and heavy. And I'm just like laying there gazing up at him, like with my legs kind of lap, uh, wrapped around him. 
And as he's doing this, I see this demon cast this illusion over his face that he's being strangled and his eyes are bulging out of his head. His face is turning purple. I'm really seeing like he's about to die, but I knew it was happening in this layer of the spirit and that wasn't actually happening to his flesh. But going back, I know that this was a reflection of the fact that he really was dying in his own sin. He was dead in his sin. He was bound to this sin and it was strangling him. So at the same moment that this is all happening, I feel my woman parts feel so unsafe. Um, And God drops it in my awareness. This demon wants you for sex. So going back to how that was the first thing God began to speak to me in his word about sexual immorality, he told me in that moment, this demon wants you for sex. And so it's just a little like peace that I had and was kind of aware of. But anyways, this goes on. He's breathing for a while. And finally, like the spirit kind of lets up. But for the next like four hours, we still felt like it's presence. And we were like, what was that? Like, what does this mean? Like, why did this happen? And I knew like angels are messengers. Um, But this is okay. So if this is a fallen angel, what is this a message of? Like, what does this mean? So we were up like all night and finally it's going on four in the morning and I ask him, I'm like, can you please pray for us? Like, I'm so afraid I can't sleep. And it's so crazy too, because I wasn't a Christian. I didn't believe in Jesus, but I'm like, okay, this guy believes in Jesus and like, that's what we need. So will you please pray for us? So he prays and I still feel this demon. And, um, it, it was crazy because like the Holy Spirit is convincing me now, now at this point, like you need to be the one to pray. But this demon is telepathically battling me, telling me, who are you to pray? You're not going to pray. You don't even know Jesus. Like you blaspheme Jesus. Just And as this voice is getting more and more aggressive, the Holy Spirit is confirming to me like, you know, this is why you need to pray. Like you need to be the one. So literally I'm so humbled, tears just streaming down my face. Because I knew I had done nothing but talk bad about Jesus. And now here I am crying out to him for help. And so I didn't really know him like that. So all I said is, Jesus, like, can you please just protect us? And we ended up going to sleep that night. But this rocked my socks. Like I left this week and I was just really trying to figure out how I let this demon in. And this was a big moment of accountability for me of realizing like this demon didn't just walk into my life. I did something to let this demon in. So now I started asking myself the question, what was it? Is it, is it the drugs? Is it the sexual sin? Is it the relationship? Is it the witchcraft? Um, And so I started asking these questions, but I wasn't ready to fully repent or give my life to Jesus. So I start looking into all the other religious philosophies and what the other religions say about protecting yourself from evil. And um, I realized that while a lot of these philosophies are true, or maybe maybe true, only Jesus is going to grab your hand and fight that battle with and for you. So next thing I know, I'm reaching out to that one Christian lady that I used to hate in my yoga teacher <laughs> training who would talk about Yahweh yoga and Jesus. And I reached out to her because none of my new age friends believed that this happened to me. Like I would tell them, you know, what I saw and what happened. And they're like, oh, it's just a projection of yourself. Um, You know, this is, it must've been something you were working through at this point. Like it wasn't really a demon. It's just like a version of your shadow. Like, you know, all these new age beliefs and refutes that we get. Um, And so everybody's telling me this and I'm like, I know what I saw. And I felt so alone with that. So finally I was so desperate that I did reach out to Tammy, the Christian I knew, and she was like, please just come to church with me. And I was like, you know what? I'm trying everything else. Why not try church too? Wow. That was a, that, that's a great story, and it, but it's not the end. And I want to ask, how did that night and you going to church, how did that change your life moving forward and change you at the same time? Yeah. Going to church, I definitely thought I was going to hate it. I thought that It wasn't the place for me. Um, But when I started going to church with Tammy, I remember looking around and seeing the families and just thinking to myself, like, I want a family like this and I don't want to be a part of a broken family. And it was like God's heart was just pouring into me. And I felt so convicted about the pain that I had caused this man's family. And I now had this like godly sorrow about the ways I had been living and how selfish I had been and how poorly I treated my ex-fiance too. Like I was 
I was bad to him in seeking my women empowerment and all of this. Like I used to be the victim and I became the perpetrator. And God was just in such a gentle way convicting me of all of these things and how selfish I had been. And it was a really slow process. But I remember I continued to I continued to dabble in my old lifestyle, but trying to figure out God and trying to close the portals to demons because I was really afraid and I lived alone. But it was really hard because these things were like addictions at this point, And this relationship was like an addiction at this point. So God convicted both of us that we needed to stop having sex and that sex was clouding our ability to see clearly. And so I became really convicted of this, but I felt like he wasn't as convicted. And he kept like every time we were together, like it felt like he was trying to conquer me. Um, And I just began to see like the more I got to know God and like was exposed to the Bible again, that somebody who really loved me would want to protect me, would want to protect my purity. And the way that he was jeopardizing that every time I was around him, I was like, I don't think this guy actually has my best interest in mind. And so there was one weekend where I ended up sleeping with him again, even after having this conviction. And I remember feeling the same like demonic energy from when I was with him come into my room and it felt wicked and like it was it was like happy that I let it back in and it was like this like wicked joy and it was like this unseen battle in the spirit happening where and at this point Tammy had told me if ever you feel something like this again you can put on worship music um And all these things. So I'm playing reckless love and God convicts me like right away. You need to throw everything away. So I'm throwing away the psychic books, the astrology books, the tarot cards, the mushrooms, everything. Um, And I knew at that point that like what the Bible says about sex is also true and that only the marriage bed is covered by the blood of Jesus and protected by the blood of Jesus. But sex outside of marriage is not covered, is not protected. And this is another portal for demons to come in. And so all these things I'm just so convicted of, but it was a process because these things were addictions for me and like lifelong habits. So it was a process of getting burnt and, you know, by God's grace and strength, getting back up again and, getting stronger and learning. Um, but at that point, I was convinced that the Bible is true and that that God told us all these things to keep us protected so that you didn't experience demons like what I was experiencing because of my sin. But then the next part was getting convinced that Jesus was really God. Yeah. that I don't know how long that process took, but I want to touch on something that you mentioned because it's a problem that I talk about all the time. I don't necessarily talk about it on this channel, but Nowadays, a lot of people confuse attraction and sex with love when they're co- two completely different things. And you yeah. never truly had love. So I guess that's probably why you couldn't really make the difference. But that's yeah. the reason why you, your relationships were so horrible and why people were using you. And I think it's a good reminder for people at home that are watching this. that There's a there's very much a big difference between love and, and sex and attraction. And you see it yeah. when the hard times come. Because love is going to be subservient to the other. And if there is no love, you only think about yourself. And I think that's the reason why there's so many divorces. So I thought it was really interesting that you brought it up. Um, But now you talked about throwing all the things that were in your house. You had like some weird idols and mushrooms and lots of stuff. Just threw all of that away. And that's also, I think, around that same time, where you deleted all the videos on your YouTube channel because you used to make YouTube videos about new age and you deleted all of that and you started what is now uh, the Raised and Redeemed podcast, which you do, which I love, by the way, and you started that. So uh, that's quite awesome. And what part of that process do you think was the hardest part? Yeah, I think I was just so humbled. And I think that was the hardest part is realizing that I had been wrong and that I was so audacious in my wrongness like I remember my old YouTube channel just being so passionate about what I was teaching and the patriarchy and the suppression and oppression and all these things and I was just so humbled by God's love and really encountering him um that was the hardest part is just realizing I had been wrong and 
and just feeling so vulnerable and like, oh my gosh, I know nothing. And, and realizing like I have a whole Bible to read to even begin to understand like how to keep myself spiritually protected. And, but then really clinging to God's grace in that too. And, and I also wondered like, how am I going to change my ways? Like I've lived like this my whole life. Like, how am I going to not sleep around and not do drugs and not drink? Like all these things were like, it was so stressful for me. And God just gave me this peace that, you know, if you continue to pull close to me, I will give you the strength each day. Your ways will gradually change the closer you get to me. Like you don't need to stress yourself out right now, like trying to be perfect all at once. He never held me to that standard. Um, but it took it encountering Jesus in a dream to really like be for sure, for sure that Jesus was God. Because at that point I'd been praying so much, like I was giving up everything. I gave up like my whole old life. And I really wanted to know for sure, like that you are who you say you are. Like I believe in the Bible, but I'm not a hundred percent about Jesus. And he came to me in two back to back dreams. I don't know. I kind of, I brought it. Do you want me to go into those? Uh, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this one dream, this is in January of 2021 now where I had been just blindly obeying, you know, I'd been obeying the best I could. I finally got rid of this relationship. I'm going to church. I'm going to um, these support recovery groups. Like I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm still backsliding. Sometimes I was still smoking weed, sometimes falling into drinking here and there. But every time I did it, I realized these things aren't fulfilling me. Um, like nothing fulfills me like God and his love and being in his house with his people. So I was beginning to learn those things and how to let those things go. But I was praying so much too, that God would reveal himself as Jesus to me so that I would really know that like God was Jesus, because that was what led me into the new age and all those things is I believed in God, but I didn't believe Jesus was God or what he said, how he said to approach God was the truth. So finally, after six months of just obeying the best I could, falling short, still falling short, but obeying Uh the best I could and getting better and getting sanctified, God gave me these dreams. And the one was on a Monday and it was like this. It was like I woke up and I was walking through my apartment. And I get lifted up and thrown into this black abyss. And I'm I'm like feeling the eeriness of this. And so it happens again where I'm like, okay, I must have been asleep. So I wake up again for a second time, walking through my apartment. And I'm like, I think I'm really awake this time. And no, I get levitated up and thrown into a black abyss. So this happens to me three times of getting thrown into this darkness and then feel like waking up for the final time feeling like, okay, that's really eerie. What does that mean? Well, looking back, I see it's like, I became aware of God, but then got thrown into the new age. I was confused into deception or, you know, I got awakened to this, but thrown into this sin or that sin, whatever else darkness that consumed my life. So the next couple of days I was really eerie out. But then on a Wednesday of that same week, I had the sequel to this dream where I wake up and I'm in this black abyss. Like the ultimate, just like everything is black. There's no oxygen. There's no peace. There's no love. Like this was hell. And I'm there and I'm restless and my body is like wanting to run, but I can't run and I can't breathe and I can't rest and there's no peace. And just then I see this glimmer of light in a distance, just this tiny little flick of light. And I remember feeling like a sense of hope that, okay, there's light out there somewhere. And before I know it, this light zooms up to me and it's all around me. And I feel the warmth of this light and my body is at rest and I have no questions. And I'm just like at peace for the first time in my life. And as I'm floating in this warmth and in this light through the center of this, like it looked like the sun right in front of me through the center of the sun begins to come the face of Jesus. And it wasn't like super clear. Um, but I saw it was like the figure of Jesus coming forward from the sun. And I woke up after that and I was like, it, it's you. Like I knew I encountered Jesus in that dream and he gave me peace that it, it's always been Jesus. He was always with me. He saved me from that hell. He saved me from that black abyss. He saved me from that relationship that was stealing my soul. He saved me from my dad's house back when I was a child. He saved me from that town. Like it was always him and he was always with me. He tried to save me from the aliens and I didn't listen to him. I rejected him. Just the fact that he was always, always there, even when I was rejecting him and denying him. Um, and so it was really that that initiated 
raised and redeemed because I had been sharing on my YouTube here and there about what happened. Like, oh my gosh, I saw a demon, you guys. And like, I was sharing these things. Um, but then I really just went quiet for about a year of just like getting to know God and getting to know the truth before I was like, I really want to start sharing again. And that's when I started posting more um, and started actual the actual Raised and Redeemed podcast and YouTube channel um, was after spending that time with Jesus and knowing like, I want to share this testimony and I want to hear other people's testimonies and continue to learn about and glorify God because he changed my whole life and redeemed every aspect of it. That's awesome. And your story is very beautiful because you started very broken and you had a lot of trauma, a lot of wounds. And even if you ran away from God for some time, he, he always stayed there with you, gave you the opportunity. And when you were ready to accept it, he finally brought healing to all the parts of your life that were broken. And now you're starting yeah. a family. Congratulations on that. And Thank you are you. now married with a wonderful, wonderful husband. You are yeah. building the family that you saw at church that you kind of wanted that you saw that you didn't have so yeah. that's amazing and i want to ask you for this final question if you could go back to a younger version of yourself knowing what you know now what would you tell that person mm. so the story of hagar comes to mind a lot of times when i'm asked about this um uh, it was I'll just explain a little bit about about Hagar and how she was the Egyptian maidservant of Abraham's wife, Sarah, and how she got pregnant with the illegitimate son and then kicked out because Sarah was jealous. Obviously, like uh, polygamous relationships don't work. So anyway, she runs out into the desert and she's feeling so alone and helpless and vulnerable. And this is where she encountered the Lord. And I remember just when I read about this for the first time and she's like, you are the God who sees me. And I just remember feeling so alone in my darkness for so like my entire life. And that's why that final dream is so climatic. Like Jesus knew that I felt like I was alone and suffocating in my darkness. And so just if I could go back and tell that little girl anything, it's just that he sees you. He sees you. He knows where you are. And he wants to come in and grab your hand and, and pull you out of that darkness. You just have to trust in him. Thank you for watching this episode of the Almost False Podcast. If you want to hear the beginning of this conversation, head over to Locals where we post the unreleased footage from our interviews and where we also have the after show in which you can get to know our guests more personally and hear about what their life is like now. The link is in the description. Have a great day and stay blessed.